Yeah, so, so there's something, I mean, Clubhouse, there's a, it's still a mystery to me because I also use Discord voice. There's an intimacy to voice. Oh, for sure. That well, you have people's, yeah, tent. It's, it's yeah. I, well, it, but like the video gets in the way, actually, in a yeah. weird way. There's a privacy when you just use voice. People are not taking showers now, Lex. I mean, yeah, this is, this we're in a pandemic and people just roll out of bed. And the hair Nobody, thing, nobody's getting haircuts. Nobody's hair is good. Nobody's getting haircuts. Yeah. People are wearing gym clothes. I mean, Zoom is just horrific to be on Zoom for five hours a day. It is exhausting. Well, it, it does make me wonder what the, what uh, once we emerge from the pandemic, whether a, pro a product market fit, how that evolves with yeah. uh, with Clubhouse and all those kinds of things. Yeah, no, Clubhouse is a beneficiary of the pandemic for sure. When do you think uh, the pandemic, when do you think deaths will be under, let's say 200 a day and we'll have 200 million people on the other side of this? Because that's kind of what it takes, right? You got to get to 150, 200 million people on the other side and in America. I haven't, you know, I personally stopped deeply thinking about this because I've been frustrated for so long. Ah. That you checked out. I almost checked out because it uh, uh, psychologically allows me to carry on because I thought for many months now uh, that testing needs to be done at scale. And it still hasn't gotten done. It has been. So ridiculous. We gave up basically on testing. We gave up? Because we're, and we're all sitting there waiting for vaccine to come along. Uh, and the distribution of the vaccine is not you know, it's struggling from the same kind of things as the testing is gonna take yeah. uh, quite a bit of time. So it does, if everything goes great, meaning there's not a second strand of the virus that's going to create a second major wave, that I am cynical enough to think that it won't be until midsummer that we start opening back up. And it, Yeah, I think it's gonna be May, June. I'm a little bit earlier than you. I've been tracking it. It's like 1.5 million shots in arms a day. I think this vaccine's been undersold. I mean, it's a miracle. Not one person who was in the trials died yeah. who took it, and only one went to the hospital, and they weren't even put on a ventilator. So, And the hospitalizations are plummeting, and we're at 10% now in the United States. At the pace we're going, at 1.5 a day, I think when the Johnson Johnson one comes out next month, it'll be 3 million a day, maybe, two and a half. And we already have 100 million people who've likely had it. So I've been doing the math. I think we're like 60 days away February, March, yeah, sometime in April, I think anybody's going to be able to get a shot, and the number of deaths is going to go below 200 a day. Yeah. And once that happens, I think people have had enough of this. They're just going to go YOLO. <laughs> Yo, I. But see, the the crucial piece for me that I've been focusing on is the the social media aspect of how the it's not just about the reality of deaths; it's about the state of the uh, collective intelligence of the human species, which mm -hmm. is determined by our communication on social media. Fear. So fear. we could, yeah, we can be s collectively afraid, the fear can spread, or it could be YOLO can spread, or it could be yeah. uh, like all, all different kinds of misinformation. And of course, during the election year, the politics influences our perception of yep. what is true and not. But, you know, having real, rigorous nuanced conversation about this kind of stuff is the way is the way out of this and mm. that's where social media really comes in because social media has, drives division mm. where the people form tribes and so on and it, it feels like it's honestly a technology problem you know people yeah. say it's a human problem but it just feels like I, no, I believe I mean, the, humans are good and we, technology we, can enable them to be thoughtful and, and we talked earlier about um you know, this, the magic of Silicon Valley and then maybe going too far with the Facebook groups example where, you know, you take out all that friction. What happened was the, we used to have something called R-Cron, reverse chronological order. That's how you consume a feed. So any kind of social feed like Twitter was in reverse chronological order. The newest thing was up top and you would just work your way backwards. And so it gave this like really fresh feeling. And then a guy named Dave Morin and the team over at Facebook realized, you know, there are some things that got a lot of attention two hours ago, and the stuff since then has not been as important. But if you missed that, there was a really good tweet where there was a really good update, like somebody had a baby. Let's, that's got a, can we get the baby one at the top? And it was like, well, how would we do that? How would we know that that's the important one? It's like, well, let's, let's put a like button on it mm -hmm. and let's see how many comments there are. So if it gets a lot of likes or comments or retweets, let's show those first, and then we'll kind of mix in the most recent stuff. And so when you're on Twitter, and then tw when Facebook did that, Facebook became so addicting, because Facebook was on, 
what has got the most engagement? Put that first. So every time you open up Facebook, get the dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when you see the bar mitzvah photo or, you know, the enraging story about some injustice in the world? You retweet it. You write a comment. Mm -hmm. You share it on your wall. And thus, this addiction to the outrageous, the outlandish, the inspiring occurred. And it used to be like inspiring stuff, puppies or some heartwarming story. And then it got dark. And then people started to realize, if I want to show up on the top of my friend's feeds, if I say something controversial or I'm outraged, I get to the top. And then that's when outrage culture came in. And then that's when cancel culture came in. Everybody started to realize, if I try to cancel that person for being a racist or a sexist or a horrible human being or whatever they did that's wrong, I get to the top of the feed. And we all collectively started playing a very weird video game, yeah. which is how outraged can we all be? Yeah. And to get to the top of the list. And then of course, with Trump, he realized it and he's like, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna make fun of a celebrity and I get more retweets. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna make fun of Rosie O'Donnell for being overweight or something. And he just starts attacking people. Yeah. And people are like, oh my God, what did he say? And he copied that from Howard Stern because he was in New York and he used to be on Howard Stern and Howard Stern took over all the dialogue in the 80s and 90s because he was outrageous. And then Trump did that. And then social media incorporated that into the operating system. It became the actual device of social media was the ding, 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 ding. We've got yeah. something incredible for you. Everybody salivates like Pavlov's dog, you know? Oh my God, I can be outraged. That's what's gotta be undone. And the only way for that to be undone is these things can't be billions of people where uh, the most outrageous thing that happened in the world today in the last five minutes mm -hmm. is now in front of you. And that's why people have anxiety, they don't sleep, and they doom scroll all night is because the human mind was not meant to process this much suffering, pain, anger. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have all this mental health issues. Also, you know, young girls or even adults watching other people post their private jets and their vacations mm -hmm. and, you know, YOLO adventures on their Instagram to the point at which young people are now faking being on private jets to put on their Instagram and, and creating like this crazy FOMO around their Instagrams. Like now we wonder why people are unhappy. Like if you think everybody's on a private jet going to some Michelin star restaurant or whatever the coolest thing in the world is today. Yeah like going to the Grammys, going to whatever, Coachella, Burning Man, like you're like, oh, but I'm home. <laughs> I'm yeah. in my house. Yeah. And I'm not at Burning Man. Getting oh. inadequate. Exactly. So the, this whole system is is uh, creating the wrong set of incentives. I tend to 100%. believe it's possible to still have extremely high engagement and create a successful, profitable business while encouraging personal growth, like yeah. encouraging people to be the best version of themselves. I just think we haven't, we got the first generation of social networks. Yeah. I think a new generation needs to Absolutely. be built. Absolutely. Is that your plan for a business to do a social network? Well, plan? I have a longer term plan okay. in terms of a bit ambition, which is uh, I believe in being able to have deep connection between human and AI systems, oh. like partners, friends. Uh, there is a, a connection to there with social media. I do think AI, AI has a strong role to play in representing us, in guiding us in mm. how we consume social media. So this algorithm that controls the feed for Facebook is a somewhat centralized algorithm, but instead to give more power to the people uh, individuals to where each one of us have our own algorithm. Bring your that own we got algorithm. Together. Bring your B -Y -O -A? own algorithm. BYOA? BYOA, I like yeah, it. Instead of bringing your own alcohol, <laughs> you bring yeah. your own algorithm. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you thought about it, if we came and said, I want, when I look at my Twitter feed, I would like to see the people with, who are the most helpful in the world, generous, kind, intelligent, considered, uh, you know, commenting on things that I don't already know about because yes. I want to open my worldview. That could be a beautiful thing for society. And actually yeah. Jack was talking about um, potentially on Twitter, letting people bring their own algorithms yeah. and sort their feeds themselves. Yeah. This would be a wonderful thing. I think it's one of the reasons Clubhouse has resonated is it's such a diverse group of people mm -hmm. that I've been able to drop in on conversations with people who are nothing like me yes, and listen in and, and hear conversations that I wouldn't normally be privy to. And I, my, everybody's like, oh, come join as a speaker. I want to do a room with you. I get asked every day, can we do a room? Can we do a room? Ask an angel investor, talk about startups. And I'm like, my usage of 
Clubhouse is going on my Peloton treadmill, putting Clubhouse on, and picking listening. a room, and just listening. Yeah, It's so delightful for me as a podcaster, yeah. where my job is to talk, to sit back and just put in a couple of miles and play chess yeah. and listen to a Clubhouse discussion that is about relationships and, or you know, some fashion or hip hop or whatever it is that I'm not part of. I just sit there and I listen and you learn. It's like such a delightful thing. I always think about these kids who go to college and I've always been so jealous of these Ivy League kids. They go and they're like, oh, I gotta go to class. And I'm like, I would just love to sit there and listen to yeah. Professor Lex talk. Yeah. You know, like to, what a privilege to sit there and let somebody else and drive learn. and talk and listen and learn. Yeah. That's the beauty of podcasting, but of course, Clubhouse creates a whole nother experience where its conversations is different. Uh, I think it's going to be the in between. I, I like it as a you release your podcast, like you and I are going to release this podcast, mm -hmm. right? And then at some point, I'll have you on my pod when you launch your startup. Well, and then so, at some point, somebody's going to be like, uh, you and I will run it. And I ran into you. I saw you were on Clubhouse the other night, and I well, I was busy, but I was gonna, almost going to click on you and say, "Let's start a room together." Yeah, but you should. and I will start a we room should. together with Eric Weinstein or somebody, or Sam Harris will jump in, or Elon, and we'll have a different experience, yeah. which will just shoot the shit, yeah. and it'll act as like a fabric uh, and and a little filler between the tent pole podcasts. 